Welcome to This Week in BJJ, the only show running the gamut of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and running it live every Friday night. Hello guys and welcome to a new episode of This Week in BJJ. I'm Budo Jake. Today is July 13th, 2012 and I'm joined with Budo Dane. How are your uh, fingers doing today, Dane? They're getting better. I have a couple of blisters and I wear them with pride. <laughs> Practicing your collar jokes, huh? Practicing my collar jokes. All right. And we got a special guest tonight. We got uh, Vince the Bear from Show Your Roll. How you doing, Vince? Good. How's it, Jake? Good. And uh, I think we should start things off with, um, what is this that you brought here? Uh, it's uh, it's my buddy's homebrew, Charles. It's called uh, Hoppy Endings. It's a homebrew 8% IPA. Nice. Some of the guys out there might not know, but you're as much into geese and jiu-jitsu as you are into beer, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big collector and connoisseur of, uh, of craft beer, uh, for sure. <laughs> what, what's the difference between, uh, for, the, for the layperson, from a craft beer versus uh, something off the shelf? I think, uh, for the most part, it's just similar to all the other stuff that's out there, but it's just craft beer, they put a little bit more into it, smaller batches, um, different styles. Like There's like 30 to 40 different styles, whereas the normal stuff is like Bud, and now the other ones are like two or three different mm -hmm. styles that you're used to so and they're oftentimes higher alcohol content right yeah so you don't have to drink a six-pack to to relax you can drink which a is glass <laughs> which is dangerous when you first get into them <laughs> for sure if you don't know how to pace yourself <laughs> S small sips for sure well speaking of that let's check out hoppy endings you said this is a home brew right yeah it's a home brew for my buddy uh, charles that helps us with a bunch of our videos so wow well thank you charles thank you this is a double IPA. I love IPAs. So, uh, Vince, you mentioned batch, and that's a word that <laughs> goes with beer and also uh, with, with geese, right? Now, now, now it's now it's all coming together. Yeah. Nice segue, by the way. I <laughs> cannot be more impressed right now. Yeah. Well, like you know, I follow craft beer a lot, and um, that's actually that's actually where we got the 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 word batch when we release batches. Usually, craft beer they release different batches um, of beers because each batch is a little different and um, instead of us calling it version or series or um, volume we called it batch hmm. so, so cheers cheers salute. so did the idea for show roll with the small batch geese come before you're into beers or, it, or was it something that it developed at the same time um, no, no I think I was into beers around the same time you know and um, so it, it kind of fell hand in hand with each other okay. you know um, it was just, I didn't want it to be the same as, I didn't want it to be series. I didn't want it to be stuff that was already out there in the market. I wanted it to be something like a little fresh and something different. So. Yeah. I mean, uh, I didn't give you a proper introduction, but you are the man behind the hottest geese out there. Show your role. And you just mentioned the word fresh. That's exactly what they are. You know, that you're not redoing the same gee over and over again, like a lot of the other companies are. You keep it really fresh and exciting. I like <laughs> that. We, tr we try, man. There's a... There's a ton of stuff out there, but, you know, we're trying to make it a little different here and there and hopefully uh, giving customers the product that they want, you know, so. Right. What are some of your design influences? Because there's a lot of times there are very much things I can see. Like if I'm walking up to the Buddha booth at an event and I see the new Shoyer Roll shirt, I don't have to see your logo. I know that's a Shoyer Roll shirt. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, I'm inspired by a ton of things, you know, like it's not just, it's not just surf, it's not just skate, it's not just BJJ, it's not just like urban lifestyle. It could be like beer, it could be like hanging out at the beach um so i just try and pull inspiration from wherever and also the 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 artists that work with us like john smalls and letty and a bunch of other guys they they pull inspiration themselves and i kind of just help direct the, their uh what they're thinking you know so um so it just it, it all depends i could pull it from hanging out in the gym or i could pull it from drinking a beer today you know like i kind of like this pattern of this the, the new walls so you know who knows that might be a new weave or something one of these days <laughs> Does it does does your work feel like work, or do you love what you do? No, I I love what I do. You know, it's it's been like nine months, eight ten months since I went full time with Shore Roll, and, and it's it's more of a dream now. You know, it's just every day is not work. I work late at night. I've always worked late at night, and I work during the day. It's just like going to the office. I do what I use usually always do, and um, it's it's not work. It's not work when you you do what you love. You know, so. Right. We're gonna take a look at your latest creation, The Ring, a little bit later in the show, so guys, stay tuned for that. Before we get too much into it, I wanted to let you know that we do have um, an email address. If you want to hit us up with any topics you want to see or submit anything for the show, that email address is twibjj 
at budovideos.com. Also, there's a chat room for any of you guys that are watching live here on Budo Videos. Just uh, underneath the video player, there's a chat room. Choose a name, and you can join us here. If you have any questions for us, uh, feel free to ask us. And uh, if we like the question, we'll bring it up on the show. So um, in this week's news, Grappler's Quest had an eight-man tournament at the UFC Expo in Las Vegas. Did you guys see any of those fights? I saw a few of them, at least highlight-wise. I caught a few of the highlights as right. well. There's a lot of lot of uh, big names there. There's a super fight with uh, Dean Lister and Demench, Ricardo Abreu, Abreu and uh, Dean Lister. Surprise, surprise, got the heel hook. Uh, he's been a heel hooking madman. It's like I don't know so him long. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Bill Cooper won the eight man tournament by toe hold over Marcelo Mafra in the finals. So uh, good job, Bill. I saw some of his matches. He's always so relaxed and so. Just looks. And when I interviewed him on Rolled Up, I asked him, "Do you roll any different on your first match in a tournament and the finals?" And he told me no. Well, you so told me that one time that um, he doesn't really research his opponents before mm -hmm. he goes into t competitions. He's like, "Whatever's going to happen is going to happen." I mean, he's Bill Cooper, and he's at the level that he's at, so he has that luxury in a way. But that's still pretty cool that he's just he just goes in there to do his thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean how, can, how can you go in there and just? Not care <laughs> and, and, and perform so well. I've been, I've been lucky enough to follow the California scene of jiu-jitsu for a while when blue was when Bill was like a green belt and Jeff was like a a blue belt at the time and and they they rolled very similar even back then like they just went for it you know they didn't stuff was exciting you know like they didn't really points were important but not as not as important as trying to go for it and keep people entertained so it's it's really refreshing you know to see those yeah. guys fight all the time yeah bill told me before that if he wins on points that's a loss for him well, wow that's how he sees it <laughs> so man props to those guys who who bring it like that for sure there's also a little bit of controversy with marcelo mafra versus enrico coco enrico is a really good no gi guy doesn't compete in the gi only no gi but he went against check mats marcelo mafra and uh let's look at the video and see what happened You can see Mafra on the bottom setting up a, an arm bar. There's looks like a hand. That's that looks like two taps to me. Yeah. So you saw one tap on one leg and one <laughs> tap on another. <laughs> on the thigh, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, so there, Enrico saying he didn't tap. Marcelo says he did. I would hate to be the ref in that match. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Possibly the hardest job in the entire world being a BJJ ref and you will never get it right <laughs> in in everybody's opinion right so so what do you guys think was that a tap looks really close to me that's just from my angle you know I don't know it's, it, it could have been in between I don't know but I mean it, it was pretty close to a tap yeah, yeah after the fact in slow motion I counted two taps so <laughs> it's hard right it's really and, hard. and that's right the IBJF rule book says that it has to have two well let me just read the that wasn't an IBGF event. It was a Grappler's Quest. I don't know exactly if the rules are, are the same, but IBGF is the only organization that has a full rule book out there. You can get that in PDF format on IBGJF.com. They did an incredible job on the rule book. But under Rule 2.2, Submission, there's four points of what is uh, calculated, what's called a submission. One is when an athlete taps twice with his hand on the opponent's on the opponent, on the ground, or himself in a clear and apparent manner. So that was two taps, but there was some time in between it. So <laughs> right, because in slow motion, it seems very apparent and very deliberate, but mm -hmm. it, and in the heat of the moment, could have been quick. Right. right. Another way to, to, uh, to get a submission, when the athlete taps the ground twice with his foot, when his arms are trapped. Uh, thirdly, when the opponent verbally withdraws, requesting the match be stopped. Or four, when the athlete screams or emits noise, expressing pain while trapped in the submission. So, based on the fact that we did see two taps, I would say that's a tap. And, and Enrico actually went back in on this, uh, this video's on YouTube, and he said that uh, watching it in a replay in the slow motion, I realized I did tap, and I feel sorry for causing the controversy, so. In, in, in his defense, too, in the heat of the moment, you know, you're not necessarily thinking about what you're doing. Yeah. You're just going. Right. <laughs> but that brings up a question. In competition, should you let go when the opponent taps, or should you let go when the ref tells you the fight's over and i've heard people <laughs> say that you know what from i'm not naming names from now on i'm not going to be a nice guy anymore yeah and i think at a certain level as you know a blue belt yeah i would let go i guess it depends how many times you got burned by the rules right. or the ref in your opinion right right and sometimes the ref's on the other side and he can't see the tap mm -hmm. uh, every time i've been in a competition i've let go 
if the guy's tapped. And thankfully, they have when I tapped. <laughs> right. But um, you have to wonder. You know, I've talked to guys before that have said that 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 they let the guy go after he tapped, and then he said he didn't. And yep. Then, and then you get this mess. So what what would you do, Vince? You're in a competition. I would let it go. You would. That's just me. Yeah. yeah. And I don't compete. <laughs> I don't compete enough. So I, uh, that's just that, that's just me. But I think as an avid competitor, if you've got burnt once or twice, you're gonna hold that thing you know? right. <laughs> until until the ref tells you to stop. So. Right. Psych in the chat room says, let go if you feel the tap. And uh, although Big Shrimpin says that uh, he'll let go when the ref stops. I Steve. love that name. <laughs> <laughs> I love <laughs> the chat room names. It's you perfect. guys always deliver. It's awesome. <laughs> so uh, the jury's still out on that. But um, yeah, for me, I would let go. It's, I don't want to hurt anybody. For sure. So uh, next up in the news, um, we had a contest for a new Nogi rash guard called the Jet. Incredible looking rash guard that just came out. I want to congratulate Dini Abdul Gapar. He won the Instagram contest. I don't know if we have a picture of that rash guard we can put up here. Uh, there he is in his winning photograph. So we have a lot of uh, contests from time to time. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram if you want to be uh, up to date on those contests. Oh, and uh, Denny, contact us on Facebook so we can send out your rash guard. So uh, one more time, we've been hitting this a lot lately, but I th we all here think it's really cool. And um, we, uh, Jake, well, Jake and I got an email from um, Bishop BJJ yet again about his study about the, the world's black belts in terms of his statistical breakdowns. Um, the full report is available for everyone out there, so you can go there. He's decided he's decided to do it by email, so you do have to submit your email, but you can get the full um, report. 18 pages, full cutler, a whole bunch of pictures. Um, I'm a nerd, so it's really interesting for me to read. But um, go to bishopbjj.com to get that. And uh, reading over the report, um, we could see it more in its entirety. And uh, he pulled the data from 90 matches at the two 2012 Worlds, which were the black belt matches. And um, he came up, again, he's coming out with some great uh, statistics. So the average match was seven minutes out of 10 for black belts. So that tells you that the majority of the matches are, are not ending in points. Right. For sure. I think the part of the controversy of people saying there's so many uh, st so much stalling and matches ending in points is people watching the finals because that's right. when it really comes down to uh, to a serious point. And, uh, but in the opening rounds of the tournament, you see a lot more submissions. And if you're going to be conservative, when are you going to be conservative, right? Right. You know, in the finals. Uh, 48% of the time, the person that pulls guard wins, and 40% of the time, the guy on top wins. So, pretty much a 50-50 split, right? Mm -hmm. But th still, 8% more times, the guard puller wins. What does that say, Vince, to you? I think uh, you're just imposing your will, you know? Uh, a guard puller, when they pull guard, it's because that's their strong spot, and they want to come up for the two first, you know? Mm -hmm. So, or go for the submission, and... Um, you know, I don't know what the 40% of the guy on top wins means. You know, I don't know if that's if he starts on top. Right. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I think um, at the highest level, the guys know where they're strong, you know. And mm -hmm. they're going to pull because they think they can sweep, prevent the guard pass, or submit, you know. Right. And they're playing their game, so it makes sense. I mean, that brings up a good point that if someone's pulling guard, they're very deliberately going to play their guard game. Whereas, I mean, I'm not saying that a takedown happens by accident, but, you know... Sometimes that presentation just presents itself, right? Yeah. Like Buchecha. For sure, for right. sure. So for passing, which is near and dear to my heart, um, standing, 43% of the, the passes were from standing and 26% were from the knees, which for Guy, for my money, seems pretty accurate. It seems to be my experience. Mm -hmm. Still surprises me that there's that much of a disparity. <laughs> but that tells me that if you're not good at your standing passes, that's what you should train. Right. Yeah. And with the whole leg drag and uh, popularity and everything, everybody's passing standing now. Mm -hmm. and no one's really, or not, 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 not too many people are passing on their knees with that being kind of what's hot right now. You know, so. Right. I'm, I mean, also from the knees too, the Barambolo being as popular it, as it is, and that's where it's best set up is from the knees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the, the full report goes into more detail, but he goes on to, s to point that the leg drag is more pop much more popular in the lower weight classes mm -hmm. and almost non existent at the higher weight classes. So For that's sure. interesting to know. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes sense. And uh, so for the wins with submissions, 35%, by far the majority, the rest of them were like, you know, 8 and 10%, were, was uh, chokes from the back. Mm -hmm. Which having worked on my <coughs> 
collar chokes from the bottom. <laughs> I I don't know. I I've, I'd always given up on on those chokes, but I, I again, this is just representative of black belt matches. So yeah, but that that again that tells you if you're not good with choking from the back, that's you should. Yeah, I think um I think if you watch like a lot of the uh, a lot of the black belt matches once they take the back, you know, everyone's shooting for the bow and arrow choke mm -hmm. and it's a high percentage choke and and you know, everybody's trying to go to the back now. That's not like it's not like a, that's it connects back to the leg drag, the defend to the leg drag is to to give your back or to or to get mounted right. <laughs> or to get mounted or something else. So like giving your back and people are just uh, JT Torres is a great example is once you give your back it's like bow and arrow like in a second so. right, right. Vince you watch uh, a lot of competition what uh, we talked about this before but what is your favorite way, um, belt level to watch uh, it has to be purple and brown for sure uh, I, I, I really like purple a lot um, but I really like black uh, brown belt as well because you know who's the next category uh, guys that's going to give guys in the black belt uh, a good time you know so right that's my my personal preference. I prefer watching purple and brown, um, sometimes even more than watching black belt. Sometimes, you know, so. And what do you enjoy about the purples uh, over the browns? Uh, I think it's just, I, I think there's just that there's still that hungerness and mm. there's it's it's serious, but um, you know, th it's I think they're not they're not as they don't hold back as much, you know. Like when you're once you get to brown belt, you're really close to black belt, so you play your game a maybe a little bit more conservative. You, you know, you watch your points maybe a little bit more. But when you're a purple belt, um, you do that, but you go for it a lot more. And I think that's where you probably see like the difference if you're watching like a bunch of purple belt finals versus a bunch of brown and black belt finals. You know, right. So. I don't think enough people, um, especially upper belts, respect the lower belts as much. Yeah. And, um, and thankfully now. All the fights are broadcast at the Worlds and the Pans, but um, you're right. The purple belts are so exciting. And you see a little more disparity sometimes in the skill level, so a lot more action and, like you say, hunger. And so I would encourage you, if you're if you're the person that only watches the black belts, tune in on one of the uh, one of the earlier days and watch the browns and purples. And there are names. I mean, King Cornelius, the Meow Brothers, there are names in the purple belt. Keenan moved up to brown belt, but, I mean, they're going into this Worlds. I remember... I remember, um, what was it Thursday or Friday, s saying to myself, yeah, I need to make sure to watch for these guys when I'm there and I see them go up because these are going to be matches to watch. And every, I mean, and it wasn't that, you know, anybody was walking through. They were all fights at the purple belt level. Yeah, I mean, um, a good example is like um, you would watch, I, I think it was a little different maybe about four or five years ago, but now with the, now that watching purple belts is accessible to everybody, um, when there's a purple belt final match going on if you're at the event um everybody's watching it <laughs> you know it's not like it's it's not like it's a white belt match where sometimes people don't really care about like if a good example is um marcio andre versus denelson mm. at the finals when galval you know got when he got um pushed out of the roads you yeah. know it was because of a purple belt match the finals you know and those are like two of the biggest up-and-coming guys in brazil at purple belt is you know marcio andre from nova and uh, Danielson from Autos, you know, and it's just it's great jujitsu. You know, it's just awesome to watch. Yeah, and these lower belts are training so hard. so hard. They're treating like a full time job for sure. Even some of the blue belts for sure. And they're tough. Mm -hmm. They're super tough. Right. And they do and they go for it. You know, they they're doing everything. You know, so it's just a matter of um hmm? them um and uh, speaking of guys that are treating it like a job, tell us a little bit about the Meow Brothers. Um, I know you're talking to them recently about uh, their tooth. Oh no, I mean, uh, I, I I heard I heard um, I heard a story through through um, through I forgot who it was, but it was basically just a story about how dedicated these kids are. You know, I mean, um, they're brothers, and uh, you know, I don't think they come from um, a well-off surrounding and background. You know, so they're doing everything: jujitsu, living in the gym, training three or four times a day and the meow um, brothers live in the gym from what i've heard i don't uh, you know don't quote me on it this is just like rumors so it could be completely false you know but at least somebody was saying that you know what i forgot if it's Jao or paulo who has who's missing who's missing a tooth you know and um and they said that um they were going to basically help him out and help him get that tooth fixed you know and and he he didn't want to do it because um because basically because he didn't want to stop training jiu-jitsu for like two or three days and they're going to pay for it i mean dude that's like so cool <laughs> you right. know like how can you not love these kids they're like 105 pounds or 20 pounds and 
they're winning like absolute categories in Brazil all the time and um and they just love jiu-jitsu you know so like i don't know if that story is true that someone told me and it's like circulating that on the net you know but i mean that story w whether it's true or not true i'm still like huge fans of them you mm -hmm. know but it just goes to show you man these kids are like super duper dedicated and these are not the only kids you know you have like a bunch of kids here in the u.s brazil and all over that are really starting to take jujitsu seriously you know so yeah wow not trying not stopping the train for three days <laughs> A lot of people, four days is their training schedule, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, long time, this week in BJJ, listeners are somewhat accustomed to this room, but um, it's getting a little cramped in here for us. So, we just want to let everyone know that maybe not the next episode, but we are working on a new studio that's bigger and nicer, and um, we're, hoping f we're hoping that it's going to be apparent when we do it, and uh, we're showing some pics right now. That's just one corner. As Maybe you can see, there's shift. no ceiling. So I'm trying to convince everyone here to let them create a pulley system to lower me from the roof. <laughs> like Lady Gaga, right? Exactly. <laughs> Angel wings and everything. <laughs> so if you guys could send emails and vote for that, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Go. I'll wait. <laughs> Still got uh, lots of uh, guests lined up for the next uh, few weeks uh, that we'll let you know about in the future. But uh, some people were asking where Sean was tonight, and uh, he had some personal matters he had to attend to. Apparently he had uh, a break-in at the academy, so he's uh, he's busy fixing things over there, and uh, we expect him back next week. Uh, we're going to cut away to a commercial in just a moment here, but before we do, I um, just want to let you guys know what's coming up. We're going to talk about Roger Gracie, some new products, and some new show your roll items. So stay tuned, guys. We'll be right back. BudoVideos.com, home of the world's largest selection of quality jiu-jitsu kimonos. Show your roll, Storm, Tatami, Bull Terrier, Venom, and others. Styles from more than 30 top brands in stock and ready to ship. BudoVideos.com, you're only a click away from owning a new gi today. Okay, guys, we're back. Uh, Vince, let's talk about you for a moment. Uh, where are you training these days? Well, first uh, of all, where did you start? Uh, I started training at the Gracie Academy back in like 99 when I first started for a couple months and Dang. Um, and then um, I ended up switching around with a couple places for a short period of time and I ended up training with Tinguina for a majority of my, the time that I learned Jiu Jitsu. So when you were training at the Gracie Academy, who was teaching? Uh, it was Kaike. Um, I think Henner was a Henner was a green belt. Uh, Hiron was a purple belt, and Horian was. Uh, teaching some classes. Hoist was still there for a short period of time. Um, but I think um, the head teacher there at that time was teaching most of the classes was Kaike. And where were you living at that time? I was still living like in the Long Beach area and I was just commuting over there. I think it was in Carson. Off in Carson. So um, I, I didn't have enough money at that time. I was broke. Uh, and, uh, and I only trained there maybe like once a week. That's all I could afford at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that for like two... I did that for like two... Um, two months and then after that I ended up spent shifting around a little bit trying to figure out where I was going to train and then I ended up training with uh, uh, Tinguina for I forgot how long maybe like six eight years or something like that mm -hmm. and um, I got my brown belt from him and and now I'm training um, now I train with um, Leandro Vieira and um, um, some of those guys and, and whoever I have access to that comes in town so but Leandro moved up north right yeah Leandro moved up north and um, so I just whoever comes through you know it's mostly like some um, my buddy, um, a good friend of mine, Chris owns a, he owns a gym right next to the, the short girl studio. It's literally like two blocks. So, um, he's a buddy. I, I got into, I got him into jujitsu like 2002 or 2003. And now he owns his own gym, like two blocks away from short girl. So nice. uh, instead of me driving 45 minutes to go train, um, <laughs> in Yorba Linda, I get to train like literally like two blocks away from sure when I'm done so uh, and it's my it's you know it's a good personal friend of mine so that's where I'm working out now and that's a check mat gym it's a check mat gym yeah tell me a little bit about uh check mat um man the guys are you know just like any other big team the guys are it's the guys are talented you know it's a huge school and um you get access to like a bunch of really good guys like Pushesh, Joao, Sis um um there's there's too many too many to name you know but I mean like those are just some guys that just stand out and anytime anyone comes from Brazil you get to work out with them you know so um, but it's a you know it's a it's it's a it's a it's a big school but you know everyone's kind of everyone's pretty friendly it's a little bit more a um, little bit more mellow than maybe some other 
schools, but um, but it's it's good, man. I, I like it because anytime people come in town, you get access to get access to get beat up by Bouchesha or <laughs> Joao or some of these big name guys. You're like, oh, I wonder how this to roll with them. You roll with them, like, oh, now I know how this to roll. With them. <laughs> <laughs> I want to roll with them again to get beat up. So, so it's good. My perception of Czech Matt is that they're very strong at the higher weight classes. For sure. Is that uh, is that how you take it, or do they have a strong uh, lower belts that just don't compete as much? You know, I think it's just like any big team. You know, I think um, depending on who can make it out to the worlds, or because um, you know, I'm I'm more than positive Alliance and Gracie Baja and um, and Novo now have really talented students in Brazil. You know, and at the lighter weights or the heavier weights, it's just sometimes they can't get their visas to come compete in the U.S. or it's too expensive. You know. And, uh, but the people that we do see in the U.S. might just be the heavier guys or the lighter guys. So, um, so I think it's you know I think it's just a matter of who can come over um, and compete if they can get their visa cleared or if they can afford the ticket. Um, but as far as like locally, yeah, I think in general, I think the, at the heavyweights, Checkmate has a really good showing. You know, just like Atos has a a, a really good showing from I would say from middle down. You know, um, and the same Gracie Ball is pretty. It's pretty sp- spread out. You know, and Nova has. Um, in different divisions as well, so and alliance as well. So, of course, check Matt. Uh, the main guys are the Vieira brothers, mm-hmm. but uh, also Lucas Leach seems to be the de facto leader when <laughs> when the Vieira brothers are away. Sure. Um, and what an exciting guy Lucas is! Always competing, oftentimes competing in higher weight classes. And uh, whenever I go over, <laughs> whenever we film them training, he's been taking it to the other guys. Yeah, I mean, um, Lucas is like the unsaid. He's like the unsung hero, you know, like. A lot of people know him, but a lot of people don't know him. And um, since he's the guy that's here, uh, you know, he's the one that coordinates a lot of the training for the team when they need training and stuff. And a lot of people don't. I mean, a lot of people don't know, but man, Lucas is killing guys. <laughs> he's like bigger guys, smaller guys, and and he trains hard. The the biggest thing I like about Lucas is the guy has like the biggest heart. You know, like he's he's a good dude. You know, and that, and that, and, and that in general just goes a long way. But for, for the most part people don't know like they see him in competition you know sometimes he does bronze sometimes he does silver sometimes he doesn't play sometimes he takes gold but when he trains with like some of these high level guys the best guys out there and he, he takes it to yeah <laughs> and you guys are probably seeing it from filming and stuff you know right so. well that's one thing i've come to know lucas is as you said hard he's he's a guy who will he's really active and um he doesn't seem to have a, a slow roll like he goes for it every single time for sure, for sure. And I asked him why compete in the heavier weight class. That seems seems reckless, you know. And his answer was that he's competed against all the guys at middleweight, so <laughs> the guys in the upper weight classes don't know him as well, and he feels like he has more space with the bigger guys. And, and that's exactly what I was saying. It's, you know, he doesn't shy away from tough matches. No, not at all. I think for him, it's. I think for him, it does. Like even if he wasn't to compete in his weight class, he's he's sparring with Bouchesh and Yuri and Joao Sis and like Sharpay and all these guys on a daily basis that are like two weight categories higher than him you know so and he's doing well with them you know so why not go up a weight and fight uh, in the heavier weight when he's doing so is that what he's like in training he'll just he he you know Buche- he'll see Bouchesha and he's like let's play yeah yeah like uh, these guys train hard you know like right. there's no yeah there's drilling and all that but when they spar it's it's no joke. It's okay. like it's a war, you yeah. know, it and it's normal for them. You know, it's like that's that, that's fine for them. <laughs> so. That's what was so cool. When last time I went to Konakoma, when they were all there, it's like watching the finals of of the world because they'll be fighting together and yeah they look like like enemies when they spawn <laughs> yeah. so by the time they get to the end of the worlds they're like whatever this is thursday for me mm-hmm. exactly it's like no it's like normal you know I, I, right. I forgot who used to do that i think it was i heard um i forgot it was an mma gym it could have been like ensign the way he trained in japan and also another uh, big mma gym and they're like oh when we spar we spar 100 percent, you know and we want to know how it feels i'm like oh that's crazy yeah but that, that was similar when i watched like Bouchesha and Carlos Zapato roll like two weeks before the Worlds and they were going hard <laughs> and I'm like it's like two weeks away you guys are going you know and, and it was fine for them that's just normal for them you know and I guess that that might be uh, you know that might be a tribute to some of their success you know so Syke in the chat room brought up something which I've heard before but maybe you can shed some light on this he said that the maybe this the uh, lighter guys from Brasa went to Atos while the heavier guys went to Checkmat 
Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the, the the lineage that tight to be able to even give like a, right. a decent opinion. So I'm not. I'm not sure about that right. at all. It certainly could be true. For sure, you got to ask that one, like Leo or uh, Galvar or someone comes in. <laughs> so Vince, you're a, a four stripe brown belt. Uh, four stripe brown belt, yeah. When are you getting your black belt? Uh, man, <laughs> whenever it's ready. I'm I'm in it for I'm in it for life, and I'm in it for the long haul. You know, I think there comes a time where you're like, oh yeah, black belt would be. When's the black belt coming? You know, when do you think I'll ever get my black belt? But I think once you like, kind of accept that you're gonna be doing jujitsu long term and you're going to be consistently learning. Like after a while, you're just like, uh, whenever, whenever I'm ready. You know, whenever the person thinks I'm ready, they'll give it to me. You know, so who knows? Could be two years. Could be ten years. <laughs> could be tomorrow. Could be tomorrow. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything gonna change for you when you get your black belt? No, I think I'm um, just trying to just trying to consistently keep up and train. You know, to be able to lead by example once you get to become a black belt you kind of have to you have that um you have that extra responsibility you know so um i think more just probably just changing my mindset instead of when you go into the gym you know you just don't go into workout like you have to you kind of have to be a, a a leader or figure to show show a good example to the the lower belts coming up so i think that's probably more just mindset that's a good point favorite position half guard for sure great stay <laughs> tuned guys we'll have uh vince show us something on the mats at the end of the show Okay, uh, let's take a look at some new products that have come, come out uh, this past week. First item is something that we filmed a couple years ago. This is a Braulio Estima arm drag seminar. He is, uh, he's a, it's a position he's great at, and um, there's nothing else out there on the gi uh, arm drag that I know of. And uh, this is a seminar he did at Gracie Baja Yorba Linda. There you can see him uh, teaching with Kyron Gracie when Kyron was a brown belt. Oh. <laughs> Lots of really good drills. He goes from the very most basic movements to much more advanced. And uh, so, yeah, if you need more help on your arm drag, I think this would be a great product for you. This is not a DVD. It's available on demand. So if you want to purchase that, you can watch it immediately wherever you are around the world. I think I've gone back to the arm drag, actually. Yeah. I may have to look at this one. Well, hey, 30, what was this? 35% uh, of the submissions at the Worlds are from the back. So there arm drag will get you there. Marcelo Garcia, mm. Brawley Ostima teaching the good stuff. <laughs> Do you like their arm drag guns? You know, I used to be, I used to geek out on it really hard, like when Marcelo was killing everybody with it, you know, and I think um, just like any jujitsu movie where you kind of geek out on it for like six months and then like, oh, this is all you want to do. Mm. Then you like forget about it for like three years right. and you're like, but I, the answer to the question, I, I love the arm drag. I just wish I could be disciplined enough to go back and like, start redrilling it so it becomes like an avid part of your overall game you know so see i went back to it just to open opportunities i'm not necessarily hopping to the back because everyone expects that but at least it gets reactions out of people and i can play something else so yeah you like it jake yeah yeah i do um it's something i need more work on but uh just like everything gotta drill 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 yeah for sure a uh, good thing is what uh, i forgot who i was training i think it was like a couple of the higher belts and uh i think i think it was it was a variation of the arm drag speaking of the arm drag i you think if you hide the arm you're okay if you post it on something but they're still dragging through it and you basically tweak your arm mm. almost like an arm bar so you still have to drag but uh, in my head i was like okay if you post it and you hide it like it, you can't drag it all the way through but even regardless if you hide it you're still hyper extending your your, your elbow mm. and they still get the the back so i, I thought that was kind of cool it's like they didn't care where you posted it even if you were blocking mm. it and couldn't cross you're still hyper extending the arm, so it had to had to go through. So. Right, mental no. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Dan. For you, <laughs> Vince Pichoy, hello everyone. Love this guy. <laughs> I should also mention that uh, that uh, on-demand product is two dollars ninety-nine cents, <sighs> and uh, available on demand at budovideos.com. Next item up is uh, something pretty flashy: uh, the Tatami Estilo Purple Gi. We have a picture of that to pop up here. Uh, won't be many people wearing a gi of that color at the academy. Unless you're Prince, in which case, <laughs> <laughs> it's all you. But yeah, it's pretty, uh, I don't know, I like something different like that. It's certainly not, wouldn't be welcome at all academies, but uh, someone looking for a little flash. Just saying A0, ladies. There you yeah. go. If you're a little tired of the pink, <laughs> alternatives. Variation. There's only a very limited number of those available, so if you want one, hop on that quick. Available on budovideos.com. And the last item for today is a brand new Nogi Industries sh uh, Jet Rash Guard. These are available in short sleeve and long sleeve, oh, black or navy blue. Those just came out this week. 
So get on those while you can. Available on Budo Videos or Nogi.com. Nogi always makes nice stuff. All right, uh, Dane, we got uh, another topic here. So Roger Gracie has been training at Black House, and um, he said uh, he he's been talking about his goals within MMA. Um, he had that knockout, and it was I think it was in a bit in a way it was. I got the sense then, you guys can maybe attest to this, that he was kind of not rethinking his entrance to MMA, but what he was doing and his goals in MMA. So um, I think we have a video of that coming up. Um, but did you guys get that sense too, that he was uh, kind of like reassessing where he was at in MMA? You know, for the uh, yeah, future, I think it's, uh, it's hard to predict, you know, Hall. I think I don't, the only thing that I plan ahead of me is to be the best fighter in the world, you know, and that's what I do. I wake up every day thinking about that, you know. E each day I have to get better than yesterday. So I know I'll be getting closer from that goal. And apart from who I'm gonna fight and when and where, I don't really care about that. You know, I think the more I train, the more opportunities will come. And, you know, more, more people will be fighting. So my goal is not to fight someone, you know. I don't wanna fight a specific guy because that is a very short goal. You know, I can fight whoever in two months, but then what? Then I have to set another goal and another goal and another goal. I think I have just one, you know. I have to be the, I want to be the best fighter in the world. Whoever is on my path, they just, you know, think that I have to remove out of my way to, to get there. So I think one day I just want to look back and say, you know what I mean? I faced them all. I was able to beat them all, hopefully, you know. <laughs> and, you know, and would now be tired. I'll be able to retire a happy person. All right. Thank you, Black House, for that uh, that interesting video. I mean, speaking of his King Mo knockout, I mean, who's, if you're going to touch up your uh, stand-up game, Black House is a place to go, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of talented guys over there. Yeah. So, do you, I mean, he was he's probably one of the most prolific competitors in BJJ. Um, do you think he really needs to do MMA? I wonder if he's, if he's bored of Jiu-Jitsu. He's been at the top for so many years. What else is there for him? Needs maybe an extra push. You mm -hmm. know what I mean, that, that's what that's kind of like. It's either goes like, a lot of the jiu-jitsu guys get out of jiu-jitsu because they need to make more money, you know. And I think I, I don't know I don't know Hodger, but I mean, he's done pretty much what you need to do in jiu-jitsu and and beyond. So and maybe he needs the extra push to to become the to cement himself as as the guy, you know, and as uh, the the Gracie because everyone knows Hodger is like one of the greatest Gracie Jiu Jitsu competitors in current you know currently where we're at you know which right. which begs the question um, since he uh, he was the guy and and a lot of mine still is the guy in Jiu Jitsu if he does poorly in MMA do you think that do you think that reflects poorly on Jiu Jitsu or at least the state of sport Jiu Jitsu I think maybe for like the sport Jiu Jitsu guys you know I think the sport Jiu Jitsu geek guys kind of like maybe get a little bummed that hey you know maybe you should have stayed with sport BJJ you know but I think um, I think in general I think he's just trying to push himself and see if he can't do well in this 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 sport as well and I think I think he can with time you know? sure I think it's just a matter of getting the time in you know but is age going to be a factor yeah that's what's tough it's just like jiu-jitsu <laughs> it's like you have these kids that are coming up they're like 18 to 21 and they're so well-rounded in mma great college college wrestlers great stand-up boxers great muay thai kickboxers and and great jiu-jitsu guys right. so it's like you have these guys blending this stuff for like the last four years and you know you're and now you're fighting age just like in jiu-jitsu you know so but you got to admire him for not just resting on his laurels no. and going out there and pushing himself against, like he said, the best guys in the world. Um, you know, I don't think that his motivation is for money, even though that would be the right step if he was looking for money. Um, I think it's just that he's looking for the biggest challenge. Which is awesome. Yeah, and that, sure. that's, that's exactly what I think in my, in my mind, too. I think he's, he just wants to push himself. And if he's willing to continue to push himself in that direction, regardless of whatever the outcome is, you know, that just... You get way more res respect, in my opinion, just for making that extra push. Right, because I got the sense that his, ac his academy was doing well enough that he could support himself and support his family. And, you know, he definitely has the name. He may not be making money, you know, necessarily from uh, from winning the Moon Jails or whatever, but his name was helping, f you know, market his academy. So, uh, really, to go into MMA was purely, 
purely for the challenge of it. But one thing he said that I <laughs> found really interesting, it was sort of an, a no dumb moment, was when he said, I read this in an interview where he said 80% of, of jiu-jitsu, and I'm assuming he means sport jiu-jitsu, is useless in MMA. And I wonder, you know, not just him training at Black House, but him kind of reevaluating his game if he's if he's sort of honing everything specifically from MMA. Because I definitely got the sense, if you sh- saw his two matches, that he was going in there to submit, which was good because it plays to his game, but he wasn't necessarily, I don't know if, I mean, I haven't seen him train, but he wasn't necessarily focusing completely on MMA or just honing everything towards the MMA, the MMA game. Yeah, I'd like to pick his brain a little bit more and know what, what he means by 80% of, of jiu-jitsu is useless in MMA. Um, I mean, certainly all the gi techniques aren't going to work. There's no collars and stuff like that, but... But yeah, I'd like some clarification. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a red, I saw a red comment where on a message board, I think it was, where it was like, "Well, considering that there's like 30 different gi chokes, yeah, I could see those wouldn't apply." <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you figure in MMA also, you know, I mean, there's, it's it's with the way it's evolved, you know, like normal jujitsu that's basic jujitsu arm bars, chokes. I mean, with punching, getting punched in the face, and and wrestlers and everyone learning jujitsu, it's not as effective as it used to be you know unless you're getting like super creative with it but on the mma side you know like getting punched in the face and working with stuff in the gym like uh like shinyo shinyo yuki is like one of my favorite fighters to watch right. in mma because he makes jujitsu work in yeah, mma right. you know and, well, and I, mean, I think it's just he's creative with his with his setups and he trains maybe without the gi and and, and gets used to setting up those those transitions with getting punched in the face. <laughs> I mean, I've grappled a couple guys that were not necessarily jiu-jitsu competitors, but they'd competed in MMA, and you have to be aware of submissions, you know? Like, I wouldn't necessarily say you're immediate purple belt, but there's there's awareness there where you can't just go in as a pure BJJ competitor and expect to just, you know, pop into high-level tournaments anymore. Yeah, uh, I believe it was Carlos, Carlos Gracie Jr. that told me that for every time you get punched hard, you lose one belt level. <laughs> <laughs> so get punched three times and you're a blue belt. Blue man, go black to blue belt. <laughs> I cannot fight MMA anytime soon, though. Mm. It'll be like a gray belt or whatever. I don't <laughs> like getting punched in the face. <laughs> right. Go jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> so, Vince, let's talk about some new products. There's something coming out on the 23rd. Yep. Monday the 23rd. 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. <laughs> and what is that? Sorry, that was, that was, <laughs> I was feeling a little chal, <laughs> chal, <laughs> sun, chal sun in his right there, you know. But <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we got the ring coming out on, on um, the 23rd at 3, p- 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And you brought one with you, right? Yeah, I brought one. I brought one with me. Um, that um, It's basically the ring, the our athlete series gi that we're releasing with Ryan Hall. Um, it's a black and purple gi that we did as a prototype, I mean, like two years ago. And um, there's a picture of a... Wayne Ashford shooting a Budo Dave's picture, who's an awesome freaking photographer. Thank you, Dave. Um, but that's Wayne. Um, that's that's Wayne Ashford, one of Cobrina's guys, Alliance um, guys that we support. But um, that was just a picture of him, and it's a black gi, uh, pearl weave um, with lightweight drill pants, and um, it's it's inspired by Ryan Hall, some of his inspirations, but more. Um, that gi was we gave it to Ryan as a prototype like two years ago. We did an interview with him when he's at Shoro Studio, and and um, and he really liked it, you know. And then it started to get like all kinds of like crazy, um, crazy demand, you know, as far as people wanting it, you know. And and, and we just decided, okay, like let's put together. Let's we've been we've been wanting to work with Ryan on a project for like the last four years, so it's just like it made sense. And Ryan just kind of got on board with the project and. Um, it's 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 his gi, you know. So. Was it that same color scheme when it was the prototype? Uh yes. The only difference was there was ripstop pants on the prototype. Because the black and purple looks, I think the black and purple looks great. Yeah, yeah. It, look, it looks super sharp. It's like that's exactly it. Mock-up wise, it's like when we're putting up mock-ups and we're designing it on Illustrator and uh, on the computer, like oh, okay, it looks cool. It always looks better. <laughs> it always looks better in person. Like when we were shooting the uh, the pictures yesterday, the day before with with uh with Budo Dave and uh, we're taking pictures away and I'm looking like, looking at the game like man that's that looks freaking sharp. Yeah, it's really sharp. <laughs> Where did the colors come from? Is there an inspiration for that? Um no not 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 more. We're just kinda like playing with color combinations, seeing what fits, seeing what looks good. You know, it's like for us it's 
we try and make the stuff look good without going over the top and making sure it making sure it looks okay you know um, we don't want to make anything too crazy sometimes sometimes we do it but for the most part we want to make it look as clean as possible and make sure the colors blend you know so that was um no, no true inspiration behind the colorway so Zachi Ipon is asking in the chat is asking what the name means um well th the name itself that came from um that came from our Ryan Hall himself you know he's he's a big fan of um he's a big fan of Lord of the Rings and stuff like that yes. so, so he want to uh, he want to he likes quotes and all this stuff that keeps him keeps him pumped up and stuff so he's like hey why don't we try and like try and put something um together you know in remembrance of uh, of of Lord of the Rings so it's um nothing's too tied to Lord of the Rings it's just uh there's a super small quote on the on the uh, inside the printed inside the gi that was a, a quote that uh, Ryan really liked a lot and um, you know he, he likes to use a lot of those quotes to keep him going keep him motivated and usually um, um, what inspires him so we use that in, in some of the design aspects of the gi. Did, did Ryan choose the colors or did you present it to him? Uh, the colors are already they're already set mm -hmm. um, Ryan just put his Ryan put his input on sizing and and fabrics and also on um, and also on design elements of the gi and um, we went back and forth a couple of times and then until we got like something to where it worked and, and then boom, there it is, the ring. Two years in the making, sorry for the nice. delay, guys. <laughs> Can we take a look at it? Yeah, for sure. I have the, the pants on, so please excuse me, but um, this is uh, the actual top itself. Wow. So. Single weave. Uh, yeah, it's actually um, uh, like it's a it's a pearl single. Yeah, so it's the pearl is really really similar to to uh, to a single, you know, um, and it look it feels a little different just because the dye, the black, you know. So I'll hold uh, it up. So um, sorry guys, got a nice okay. purple trim on the inside too. Yeah, got a nice little purple trim. Um, inside has um ha has um some character writings that basically came from the inspiration of the of the. Um, Lord of the Rings itself. Um, this is the actual prototype, so it doesn't have the direct quote printed in here. Um, but the the uh, the other version has the the direct quote printed in here. And um, in here, just some inside taping uh, athlete series by Ryan Hall. Um, there's just some embroidery here. The back is pretty clean. Um, I'll switch it around for him. Yeah, the the back's just a clean back. Um, and then this has a logo here on the side. And for the most part, I mean, um, and then I'm wearing the pants, and the, the pants uh, the, doesn't have anything crazy. Um, the difference is on this ski, actually we did it on the Complight ski as well. I can't show the detail because I'm wearing the pants, but um, we started to reinforce all the seams on the pant from the crotch all the way around. So um, on all our pants now, um, from the crotch line, the little triangle part, the gusset part, um, that's all double reinforced now. So um, just adding little things here and there. I mean, we don't change our geese a ton as far as like design and everything um, we just try and figure little things that can that can help and maybe play with a new fabric or a new blend and go from there so I like the, how there's always plenty of room for your school patches or anything else you want to put on yeah I mean we've never been a huge um, like some some people some people um, look at the geese like man what'd you guys do different you know like it's just the same the same color or different color and for the most part it's the same gi and you know s sometimes it's we only make real small changes you know it could be a colorway it could be um adding an artist to the adding an artist to the to the mix on the design side and uh, for the most part our geese are pretty simple you yeah. know we're not gonna we're not gonna um put a bunch of patches all over the place unless that's a theme gi that we we want to do for that specific release you know so i mean that said um I, being at Pans in the Worlds and you know doing the events, you can count like if there's three different Shoyro geese lined up, I, I can tell them like, oh, there's the Count, there's you know the Americana, uh, you know, and I can see them from across the mat. They're pretty signature. Yeah, it's 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 cool that it's cool that the um, it's cool that um, that people are able to follow the names and stuff. It's for us, it's a little easier, you know, and for us, um, uh, being able to design and inspire a gee using something or something that inspires us. Um, it's it's a lot easier than just calling it batch 12 or batch 13, you know, um, and uh, it, it just it just helps tie in the whole thing, you know. So um, we'll see. We have we have a we have a bunch of geese coming, and um, this is just one of them that we've been super stoked and excited about for a very long time, and we're just happy that we're able to finally um, produce it. I know it's we've we've talked about it for <laughs> a long time, and people have been pretty impatient, you know. But um, we're changing the way we're doing pre-sales. We're changing the way we're releasing stuff. Um, 
we're consistently trying to evolve to get better to help our customers you know and it's it's some of it's good and some of it it may not work for everybody but um we're we're um we're at least aware of some of our downfalls as a company you know and and where we can try and help get better to kind of get more of our product to people without going against with what going against what we do and the company's values you know so well you've been doing a great job vince so this one it goes on sale on Monday the 23rd. Yep. And when do you expect those to be uh, shipping out? Uh, I think we have it set right now for, I, th I think the, the date's set for the 15th, if I'm not mistaken, the following month. Um, but um, hopefully if the fall goes well, we might even try to get it out earlier than that. You know, I mean, right now it's set for um, the 15th of the following month after that. Um, but we're going to try and get it out um, the sooner the better. You know, I mean, we what we want to do is just try and, get keys out to customers quicker you know we don't like the pre-sale thing any more than probably anybody else does so we're trying to shorten the windows we're trying to um, get geese quick to people quicker we're trying to get more geese to people so nice and what's coming on deck after that um, we have a couple projects coming up you know we have a uh, uh, we have a gee coming out with um, Leo Vieira who's just jumped on the on the team which is called uh, the gold star which is a super cool gee um, we have a um, the Rio Koi that's right after this um, gi will be released, and that's um, that should be hitting next month um, if all goes well, you know. And we we've we've put some of the information out there, um, and the reason why we haven't really followed up on um, on the releases is because um, before we used to prematurely do stuff a lot, and we you know we didn't know how our factory worked before. Um, we were just like, hey, they said that it's going to come here, and we trusted it. And it comes two months later, <laughs> and you know it's it, it's our factory, so we have to own up to it. You know, so um, now we're just trying to get information to people and letting them know when releases are coming. When we for sure know it's getting really close to hitting the port here in in LA. You know, so um, the the Rio Koi should be um, close to release next month. Um, if all goes well, you know, hopefully by the end of next month we have um, a better grasp on when the Rio Koi will be released, and it should be very soon. Uh, after this, if if all goes well, so. All right. It seems like, and I mean, you can confirm or deny this, but it seems like, especially when you're developing a physical product, a lot of it, I mean, a bit of it in terms of actually getting it is out of your hands. You know, <laughs> you send the design over, and then you're like, wait, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, we, we work super close with our factory as far as like what we're producing. We're producing. We got a bunch of stuff in the works, you know, and it's you know, besides these geese, we have so much different stuff in the works right now, you know, and. And um, and they give us a date, and we hold them to that date. Um, but we know from from previous experiences, and um, that it may not land on that date, you know. So uh, so we just kind of learn from what we've been burned with in the past, and um, and we just kind of wait till we know exactly, and we get papers on when it's hitting port, and what we've been used to getting, um, what dates that we used to get them released at our time frames, and then we just put the info out, you know. So. Well, you're all you're consistently making excellent products, and they always look better in person <laughs> than they do on the images. So uh, yeah, I'm always surprised and impressed with the work that you do. Oh, thanks, man. Hopefully, hopefully, um, we're we're gonna try and slowly get away from the the mock-ups and get you get 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 the customers real pictures and stuff like that before they buy before they buy products. You know, so it's no longer. Uh, operating out of the garage in my house and <laughs> we actually have a, a warehouse and everything that we're trying to get a, we're trying to get better and trying to get a c customers a, a better packaged product little by little you know so we're trying excellent i'll well, keep up the great work uh before we head to the mats is there anything else you want to add uh no just thank you guys for thank you budo videos for doing doing everything you guys do for jujitsu and um you know i think uh, a lot of people don't understand is uh our sport, our, our sport is our sport is really big. You know, we're all jiu-jitsu geeks and jiu-jitsu fans. And anytime we have companies that stay in the stay in the jiu-jitsu business for a long period of time and get a get information and product out to uh, customers, and it, 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 I'm just I'm just stoked on it. I'm stoked on what Budo Videos does for the sport and also for the consumer. You know, um, ten years ago, we had to watch VH, VHS tapes. Right. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> two years, two years or years past. So uh, I'm I'm just thankful for what you guys do and. And we're, uh, I'm stoked to be on the show. So thanks, guys. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot for those and kind words. And thank you for all the showreel customers that support us. Also. Yep. And once again, uh, July 23rd, 
3 p.m. Pacific time on Budo Videos and ShowyRoll.com. The ring, a limited number of ring geese will go on sale. Yeah, for sure. And um, talking about that also is if we run out, of, if we run out of stock quick, you know, some sizes we make a shorter amount of sizes on, like A4s, A5s, um, A2Hs, A3 Slims. Um, we might run out of stock on those really quick. Um, and sometimes even the popular sizes like A1 and A2. So if we run out of those sizes, you know, quick, we apologize. And uh, we'll continue to try and pick up those quantities on the next run and the future runs. So. Sounds good. Dane, anything else from you? Nothing from me other than this ghee looks amazing. All right. Well, we're going to head to the mats. So uh, enjoy these commercials, and we'll be right back with you guys. BudoVideos.com, home of the world's largest selection of quality jujitsu kimonos. Show Your Roll, Storm, Tatami, Bull Terrier, Venom, and others. Styles from more than 30 top brands in stock and ready to ship. BudoVideos.com, you're only a click away from owning a new gi today. Hi, I'm Rick Brown from LibertyStrengthTraining.com and I'm here for my friends at Kaizen Athletic to introduce to you the new Kaizen Athletic Power Mace. If you're a grappler, if you do jujitsu, if you need a strong grip, you need a power mace. Every time you pick it up, your hands are gripping this thick handle and you're getting a workout for your forearms, your elbows, your arms, and your hands. It's incredible. I'd like to show you a few of the movements that you can do with these four different sizes. The Kaizen Athletic Power Maces are available in 15, 20, 30, and 45 pounds and are available at budovideos.com. Uh, this is a cross face position where most of the time the person's cross facing keeping keeping their um, their shoulder pressure really hard on your chin and you don't really have um, much time to swim under so um, what I like to do is I like to I do this position from when they sit back on their butt here so usually this is a real common half guard pass where they keep pressure on the chin and they keep their butt down on the mat here so what I do first is I take um, right now my butt's facing this way so what i want to do is i want to turn my butt to where it starts to face him so i can fish a hook on this leg so what i'll do is um let's turn this thing up. Flip, 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 sit. so my butt's facing this way what i want to do is i want to face my butt inside this way so i'm gonna, i'm basically gonna turn my hip back to the mat so where my back's flat on the mat then i'm gonna push i'm gonna push my butt right into his basically into his his um his thigh so now my knees are pointing this way. They used to be pointing this way, but now I'm scooting my hip all the way into where they're facing this way and my butt's basically sitting on a thigh. What this d does is it basically allows this foot right here to catch this hook that's right here. So now I'm trapping this foot down here from sprawling back. Um, and then now what I can do is I get this hand, I capture his sleeve, this hand, all I do is I just 
cup here so it can't repost the arm. Okay, so now I capture this post uh, with, his, with my leg and I capture this post with my arm, cupping it. So now he has no posts on this right hand side of me. So now all I'm gonna do is basically, this leg is, uh, it's no use to me now, I don't need it. He can do whatever with it and I'm still fine. Now I use, this is my power leg. So I put this leg on the mat and I put my back straight up and I just bridge. I bridge hard here to come on top and most of the time he'll flop that leg back to sprawl, boom. And now I'm stuck, I can't go any further. But what I do now is I, this leg that's caught, I start to drag it, drag it, and come up top. One time. So okay, so we go here. I'm just in a regular traditional half guard. Now I grab a sleeve, and now I'm gonna start to move my butt close to him. Here, start to scoop my butt in. Now I have this foot, I just basically hook on top of this foot and now I just try and fish this leg back here. Now it's on the ground. And also what I do here is when I, the only reason why I'm tw turning my knees this way is so I can have the range in my, so I can have the range in this foot to fish back here. If I keep my knees like this or straight, I only have this range in my foot. My knee, my knee can't bend that far. But if I turn my knee all the way to, the, to this way, I can come way back here. So that's, that's the whole, that's the reason why I'm doing that. So when I turn my knee, I capture. So even if he turns it, move this leg out a little bit, even if he moves out even a little bit further, my range is still good. So now that I capture that, I cup the, I cup the basically the, the arm. Now I put this foot on the mat. Now I'm just doing an old school bridge, just like you learn your, your first couple months in, in Jiu Jitsu. Bridge, he basically posts back. Now I drag this leg in. Here, and now come to my stomach. There, and now you get the two points. Uh, a big variable here that a lot of people, they wonder, they wonder is that they, they always wonder, okay, um, they, think, they think from this position, they think they can go ahead and mount, right? So what happens here is when I come here, when I trap this, when I trap this leg here, and I'm doing this, right? Right away, people think they can mount, but what they don't understand is I'm already set up to still bridge just like you were to do the old school um, mount escape. So right when, if I'm doing this and he does come to mount, go ahead and come. I'm still doing the turn because I have both his posts. So, so that's just a, that's a, that's a common question that people, people ask. They say, hey, well, that's a great technique, but the guy can go right to mount. And the, 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 the answer is it's, it's really true. He can go to mount, but the, the, what, what they don't understand is this post is dead and also this post is dead. So even if he tries to come to mount, I can still turn and come on top. And that's it. All right. I want to thank Vince uh, for coming in today. We uh, learned a great technique from him and it's always great to hear from one of the hottest brands in Jiu Jitsu right now, Show Your Roll. So thank you guys for watching and we'll be back next week with another edition of This Week in BJJ. Keep on rolling. That concludes this installment of This Week in BJJ. Subscribe on iTunes, watch and review past episodes, and then be sure to join us again next Friday night right here for another live edition of This Week in BJJ.